And next up, we have Ian Harrison. So please say a big welcome. Brief history of can you hear me? Yeah. Right. A brief history of what we call electrical engineering is surprisingly long. Predictably, <laughs> predictably, it doesn't show the level of security they would like to see, though. So, what do we have from the ancient world? Uh, unfortunately, the Etruscans never utilised electricity. <laughs> <in any way. laughs> However, other civilizations did, and the left is good evidence. For example, the Roman Empire uh, used electrical rays uh, to treat patients, especially with uh, ailments such as gout. What they do is have the patients step on the electric ray and have them electrocute them until they were numb up to the knee. <laughs> and then they just step off as if they could. <laughs> For context, the, an electric ray can produce up to 200 volts at about 30 amps. An electric um, light system in the UK household is 240 volts at 6 amps and is enough to kill you. <laughs> so yeah, I'll see my modern doctor, thank you. Um, but it wasn't the Egyptians or the Greeks, Romans or the Chinese that had the greatest breakthrough. That went to the um, Parthian Empire. Parthian Empire, um, they... Made, uh, they made basically a battery. What they did, well, they got a jar with a copper tube and a metal bag went through the centre. Through experimentation that we found from Egyptian, uh, from archaeological finds in 1936, it could produce about half an amp at somewhere milliamps. Modern electrical treatments uh, utilise 0.8 volts at around about 0.2 amps. So if that was the case and that's how it worked, why didn't any other civilization use it? We don't know. A Dutch scientist, Peter von Muschenbroek, wanted to um, take electricity generated by a Hawkesbury machine, and he reasoned that electricity flowed like water, so he wanted to store it in much the same way. He took a jar, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where am I? Uh, he took a jar, put it on an insulated pad and put water in it. He took a conductor from a Hawksman machine and into the jar. Um, and he wasn't able to really store it for very long. <laughs> it wasn't until like, he forgot the insulated pad that he gave himself a crazy shock and realised what he was doing wrong. <laughs> Modern day equivalent to a Leiden jar is a capacitor, something that's in people's computers and things like that. Benjamin Franklin... I'm going to get into trouble for this one. Uh, was known for flying a kite uh, in a storm. This never actually happened. He never carried out this experiment. What he did do, he, he proposed an experiment which uh, was carried out in France by George Louis Clare. Um, what it was was a Leiden jar hooked up to a lightning rod instead of a Hawksman machine. When a lightning struck it, they realised that uh, lightning was in fact electrical in nature. What Benjamin Franklin did do was um, took this data and he reasoned that there must be units around objects. Um, when there was too many units, it would flow from the object. Not enough, it would flow to it. And this is a positive and negative charge, respectively. <laughs> Gilvani and Volta were both highly respected in the field. Um, but it was only by their own supporters. The difference between them could be compared to Galvani, who worked for an 18th century equivalent to Answers in Genesis. <laughs> but Volta worked in a, an area highly influenced by the Enlightenment movement. So, you get the idea. Um, but Galvani, to his credit, investigated using electricity in the medical field, uh, as gruesome it was at the time. He hypothesized that electricity was intrinsic to animals. He called it animal electricity. Volta disagreed, and Galvani, furious, accused him of heresy. <laughs> so Volta carefully recreated the experiments. Uh, he adjusted the variables, such as the metals used, the length of the, the cables, things like that. He eventually proved that f the frog's legs from Galvani's experiments uh, didn't react to 
uh, they reacted to the electrical charge rather than causing the electrical charge. Um, and he did this by creating a voltaic pile stuck in different metals on top of each other. And this is what we now call a battery. Um, this was crucial because it was the first time we generated electricity in a non-mechanical way. A, a Hawksman machine you cranked a handle and that's how it generated the electricity. In fairness to Galvani though, many of the medical advancements um, that we have today stem from his brutal experiments. Um, devices such as pacemakers come from the knowledge that he brought to the world through these experiments. He also inspired science fiction novels such as Mary Sherry's Frankenstein. In 1827, George Orme published The Galvanic Circuit Investigated Mathematically. It was the first time that um, V equals IR, Orme's law, was proposed. Initially, people didn't believe it, um, but within a decade or two, it was almost universally accepted. It might sound silly today that such a simple statement is obvious, um, but at the time we were still developing our understanding of current and voltage and resistance was barely even thought of. Uh, in 1812, Michael Faraday attended a lecture at the Royal Society um, given by Sir Humphrey Davy. Davy made him an assistant at the Royal Society very quickly. What Faraday did, he took the work of um, Ersted, uh, which was with magnets, and he built on it and, and he started to think of electricity in ways of fields, which is something that we hadn't even considered before that. If it wasn't for Faraday, we wouldn't have the induction motor, which almost everything in this room was built using. We still use it today because it's such a reliable method. Over the next few decades, our understanding grew so quickly that to just even list it would take all day and I'd get in a lot of trouble. So I'll just pick one rivalry, Thomas Edison <laughs> and Nikolai Tesla. Probably everyone knows most of this already. Edison was motivated by profit, that's it. If it wasn't going to bring him any money, he didn't care. He would lie about it. He would. He would just dismiss it. It would crucify people in the court of public opinion. But Edison's company drove so much forward. For example, uh, the first electrical system that was purely beyond street lighting was uh, installed by Edison's company. Um, this were in New York City. The problem with this is it wasn't financially viable outside the city itself. So your homes wouldn't be have electricity. Again, for context, uh, modern day New York City would require thousands of DC generators um, just to power the city itself, and most buildings would require their own generator. Tesla, on the other hand, he was working on alternating current with George Westinghouse. With this, he was able to show the world, using newly developed transformers, that you could step up and you could step down electricity and transport over vast distances. Today, we transfer electricity between 11,000 volts and 400,000 volts, something you couldn't do with DC. Then it brings us to the dreaded government. People were getting seriously hurt. Uh, the first death sentence had been carried out using electricity. So they brought in the wiring rules. What the wiring rules stated was, even if the wires become warmed by the ordinary current, it's proof that they are too small for the work they have to do and not to be replaced by larger wires. Thankfully, we no longer have to just touch a wire. We have technology that can do it. <laughs> but it is still the most reliable method of testing. If the wire gets hot, you know it's too small, you need to isolate it and change it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, that was brilliant. So uh, we have had a few questions, still time to get some in if you haven't asked it yet. But we will start off with a question from Anonymous. Uh, what did they think lightning was before Franklin found it was electrical? Depends who you ask. Um, God. <laughs> um, that thing that makes me cry. 
<laughs> Take your pick. Uh, another question from Anonymous. Uh, why does the UK have such horrible power outlets? Are they really safer, or is it a conspiracy theory from... Yeah, uh, big power. Uh, effectively, the way uh, we transmit and supply electricity to homes means it is safer for us. Um, for example, in America, I believe a lot of places still use 110 volts. So the lower the uh, voltage, the less the risk. Also, we earth it and we have a much safer record than most of the rest of the world electrically. If it's an installation that's well done. Uh, next question comes from Igor. <laughs> Got a nice little surprise for you in a bit as well. <laughs> so, question from Igor. Are Tesla Towers a complete hoax or is there something behind that? Maybe. <laughs> and the last question comes from James L. Is there a business opportunity here to make an electrocution platform to cure all illnesses and sell it on Goop as an <laughs> ancient medicine? Yeah. Yes, it's called buying a Tesla car. <laughs> by the way, Tesla cars are being struck by lightning a lot because they go straight back to the mains outlets. So they're acting as a lightning rod. So I'd like to say a massive thank you to Ian and we'll hand over to the next speaker.